Hi, Christy. Thanks for coming on and talking with me today. You are so welcome. I'm really happy to be here, Jake. Thank you for asking me. So you recently released your book, Wake Up Grateful, which is a book about the power of grateful living and different perspectives and practices that we can use to enhance gratefulness in our lives. Uh, in the book, you write about being diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma and some of the things that, that you went through in that process. At, at, at what point did you start to, to make this kind of shift in a new way of seeing the world that kind of got you down this road? Mm. Well, it's interesting because I'd say it comes in stages, right? So I've always been a fairly grateful person. I think it would be kind of overly radical or probably be a bestseller. But, you know, if you went from being a really, really ungrateful person right. to a grateful to a completely grateful person. Yeah. But I've always been pretty grateful. And um, and but, you know, when you get cancer, it's harder. Um, I was 32. So mm -hmm. I it was it's hard to stay grateful through those kinds of experiences. But it was a good practice for me and a good um, experiment and exploration to figure out how to stay as grateful as I could during that whole thing. But then I would say the time that I really locked in to what grateful living could be for me was when I had survived, I'd say about two and a half years and they had given me a prognosis of around three years. So maybe it was around three years. Um, and that it would come back, the cancer would come back, and then I wouldn't survive the recurrence. And so that's a heck of a way to live your life when you're in your early 30s. Yeah. And <clears throat> so I was very, very <clears throat> joyful, grateful, blissed out, super conscious, super aware of everything that was beautiful and amazing in life for the first couple of years. And then I went back to work once I had lived three years and I, I was like, all right, I want to do something constructive with my life. So I went to work for hospice. And when I got a job and I started getting back into those kinds of things in my life, I got super ungrateful. And it was so interesting to notice that contrast that that is what woke me up to, oh, I've had this experience of being so grateful. I swore I would never be ungrateful again. You know, because life is this amazing gift. And how do I honor this amazing experience of being alive? I'm just going to be so happy every single moment. And then when I lost touch with that, that was when I realized that it was a practice and it was literally a muscle I was going to need to learn to develop and strengthen on a daily basis because it just goes away as quickly as it can come. And so I wanted to go back to how good that feeling was when I first got out of treatment and I was surviving and I thought that every moment was so precious. And because I had that reference point, I was able to figure out how to get back to it, but it took a lot of work. How did you catch yourself? Because it, it's, it's so easy to get wrapped up in momentum to where like weeks have gone by, maybe a couple months have gone by and you're like, oh, I'm, I'm in a way worse spot than I was maybe a couple months ago. How, at what point were you able to kind of like notice and latch onto it and then also proactively do something about it? Such a good question. Yeah, because I've been on so many podcasts and no one's ever asked me that question. <laughs> I love that. So um, I would say it was when I got home from commuting to work, when I got back to the house where I was living, this beautiful house in the woods, and I would come home and I would just be depleted and complaining yeah. and grumpy and, oh, it was just like, you know, the world was just, you know, going at me and, you know, things were just hard. And I would come home to the same beautiful house that just a year before and this life and a partner I had. And all of a sudden, everything just looked not enough. Things, things felt, um, I felt like life was happening to me. I wasn't happening. I wasn't making life happen. Yeah. And so that was when I realized that I had some agency in that in a bigger way. I mean, I, I really had been a meditator before and I had done yoga before I got cancer. And so I was familiar with kind of Buddhist practice and mindfulness practices and stuff. But this was a really deep immersion in, oh, there's something a little bit different here. It's not just about being present. It's about really appreciating what's available to you when you're fully present. 
and and not losing touch with that and not taking it for granted. So that's that's how it lived for me. So it was in the mo- in those moments I got home, and and that's an interesting reflection for me. So thank you for asking. Where where did you start? Like as far as treating it like a practice. Yeah. Um, were, were there things that, that you were doing on a daily basis, maybe like a meditation practice or a journaling practice, something like that? Like what, what things did you start with? I did. I started and I started in the morning, which was, I think, when you can capture yourself yeah. best. Right. So it was like the end of the day I was losing it. And in the morning I knew I had a, cre- a clean slate. So I had a poetry reading practice, which I found that poems really spoke deeply to me. And then I would write and journal and, um, and make myself make commitments and make intentions. And the big thing was remembering that all of this was a blessing. All of this was unpromised. Every single moment was unpromised. And as soon as I got in touch with that and realized that it could be otherwise, and that there was a chance that maybe I wouldn't live out the day, you know, like who says that when you commute to and from work, that you're always going to make it home at the end of the day. It's like, so I, I got in touch with, there was a poem called Otherwise by Jane Kenyon, and it's really beautiful. And she died in her forties of cancer, I think. And she wrote a poem that was, I think, very moving and poignant for me, which was about how she had this life and she was able to do this thing and go out to the barn and take care of things in her barn and, and then have lunch with her partner and lie down for a nap and, and that she realized that someday it would be otherwise. Someday it will be otherwise. And that awareness is part of what I think I started getting more in touch with, which was, okay, this day is precious. It's unpromised. How am I going to live this day? And can I come back to that awareness over and over again, even in a big traffic jam, even in a hard meeting at work? Can I keep remembering that? There's a lot of conversations about some of the best ways to start your morning. There's all kinds of like morning routine blogs and videos yeah. and all this stuff about like, and I've, I've tried various stuff. Have have you found that starting off a day with something that excites you like a poem is a good way for you to, to yeah. kickstart the day? Because so, sometimes it's like, for me, if I don't, if, if I don't have something that I do, whether it be like exercise or meditation or something in the morning, it's mm-hmm. kind of like, I, I'm, I'm thinking weird for a, a little while, like after rolling out of bed, like my, my thoughts aren't like, like, it feels like there's some kind of residue that I need to wipe off and I feel better after I do. Do, do you find it's a, that it's getting, a great way to think about it? Do, do, do you find that getting in touch with, yeah, just something, something that excites you like poetry is, is a way yeah. you like to start cool. big time. So for me, one of the things that I've always noticed, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but <clears throat> I have a book. It's probably right close by here. Um, It's called Devotions by Mary Oliver. And it's basically the collection of Mary Oliver's poems. I also have a lot of other books of poetry. But part of what I find is when I read a poem, I drop into different ways of thinking, period. It completely changes how I orient to life. And suddenly I have more of a poetic lens on life. And I appreciate that because it's... um, like Mary Oliver says, um, in the end, I want to I want to be a bride who was married to amazement. I want to be like a bridegroom who held the world in his arms. It's like, and so you just kind of go, oh yeah, right. Like, don't forget to see every moment and everything around you in this poetic way. And suddenly, it's crystallized for me. It's much more nuanced. It's it pulls at me deeper. And in my writing practice, what I have found is that when I read a poem before I write, it changes my voice. It changes how I approach the exact same thing I was going to write. So say I have a topic or a paper or a blog or something, and I know what I want to write about. I just access a different voice in myself when I read a poem or two first. So so there's there's like... There's something enchanting about somebody who really has a good way with words. Mm, yes. That just, that just like changes the way that you think. Oh, yeah. And yeah. and uh, enchanting is a great word. And I think it's um, it puts us back in touch with that enchantment that's inherent in life that we lose touch with. Like, yeah, enchantment is a beautiful word. 
Um, and there are a lot of po poets who speak really deeply to, to that place for me of noticing, of wonder. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't, I mean, I could just drop a few names, but David White is a beautiful poet. Um, James Cruz is, you know, um, Rosemary Watola Traumer, Mary Oliver, just Ross Gay. Oh my gosh, Ross Gay, if you don't know his work, he's amazing. One of my favorites. Um, and Danusha Lamaris is another one. So just, I like getting up in the morning and feeding my soul. It's like the best vitamin pill you could possibly give your soul, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. And it cuts right to the chase. You don't need to get up and read a whole chapter in a book. You can get up and read this beautiful short poem, and it's so concise and just yeah. it's very direct. It's like a homeopathic remedy. You know, like <laughs> when you take homeopathy and it's like this little teeny dose of something, and it's like, I don't yeah. know. Yeah. So thank yeah. you. Yeah. And then there's a great writing practice that comes after that sometimes. I don't know if you're interested, but Liz sure. Gilbert, you know, Elizabeth Gilbert, who's written a lot of amazing books. Um, she wrote Eat, Pray, Love, and but then she's gone okay. on to, to write a lot. Um, and so Liz Gilbert has this beautiful um, writing practice, which is, she says, um, it's called the Dear Love Letters. And you write to love as if it's, so Dear Love, what would you have me know today? Dear love, what would you have me know today? And you go deep. So I read a poem or two and it doesn't have to be love. It can be dear wisdom. What would you have me right. know today? Or dear, it can be dear God. If you believe in God, it can be mm -hmm. dear. Um, I like dear gratefulness. Yeah. Dear gratefulness. What would you have me know today? And that's just, usually it's like, remember it's about right. remembering, not something new. It's just yeah. that your soul is wanting to call you forward into your best life. And so through this writing practice, you access your soul, your kind of more poetic yeah. voice, like your soul voice. Yeah. The, reminding was something I was going to ask about because it, this was another one of those books that when I was reading, it, I was like, oh yeah, like I Wake forgot. Wake up grateful? Yeah. Yeah. When yeah, I was reading, right. I was like, that's right. Like it, it was just another one of those like slap in the face like like I like I I know I'm supposed to do this and I just forget. Yeah. Like sure. is, is 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 that something that that you struggled much with after that point where you realized like when you had gotten a job or or do you have it pretty dialed in right now just through consistent practice? No, I just okay. taught a workshop uh, last weekend a week uh, eight days ago or nine days ago I guess um, the whole weekend with people and. Um, you know, one of the things I say to everybody, they're there to study and to learn to practice being grateful and living gratefully. And I say, you know, the reason why it's called a practice is there is no perfect. Right. You know, it's so refreshing and helpful and compassionate to, to say everything is a practice and it's a moment to moment practice. And I forget all the time. And one of the things that I love is that like I have Oh my God. I, I'm doing it again. I'm looking around me as I'm sitting with you. Um, no problem. <laughs> I, I have these stickers and I put little post-it notes on things and I put stickers on things and I have quotes all over the place and yeah. I have books of poetry everywhere. And I have question like um, gratitude cards that have questions on them and daily decks. And, and then I have people in my life who remind me and who I talk to. And so I think one of the things that I really believe so much, Jake, is that the world we live in does not help us stay wired to be grateful right. in our moments and with what we have and to be content and to feel satiated. And, yeah. you know, our culture is more hell bent on, on creating insatiability on yeah. the fact that like, you're never going to be satisfied. And so more, more, more. Um, anyway, I, I think it's so important, especially for going against the grain of all the social messaging and the cultural mm -hmm. messaging and media all the stuff that's out there that's saying different is better and compare yourself. And if you don't have this, then you don't have enough and blah, 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 blah. So yeah. like on and on and on and on. It's relentless. It's insidious. It's yeah. in the air. It's in the water we breathe. Water we breathe. It's in the air we breathe and the water we drink. So I think surrounding ourselves with reminders is the most important thing of all, which is what poetry is for me as well. It's those, those, ways of remembering what we know is true and then staying in touch with that, but realizing that that too is going to be fleeting. So we have to come back to it again and know 
I like to call it a spiritual muscle. It's a, it's perspective and keeping perspective and remembering those things takes spiritual musculature. So we have to literally build it and, and maintain that practice, whatever those practices are to stay in touch with the fact that life is precious. Yeah. With the principles that you lay out in the book, the one that, that really caught my eye that I hadn't heard of before was appreciation is generative. Oh, cool. Um, does does this practice of getting in touch with poetry and things and then turning it into your own kind of writing is that mm. is that kind of along the same lines what a great question i would say yes in a in a in slightly indirect way what what i love is that the second part of that principle every principle has like a truth, which is appreciation is generative, and then mm -hmm. a call to action. When you tend what you value, what you value thrives. So that's the key part is it's actually an active practice yeah. to attend to something. And then you're, if you, if something's important to you and you're not tending it and it's, fl and it's like floundering, you should not be surprised. So right. it takes attention and regular commitment. And then things really flourish in the nourishment of our appreciation. Like when mm -hmm. we're really actively appreciating things, if you're appreciating your friends and like, say you have one friend that you really appreciate and you really constantly let them know what they mean to you. And you're actively letting them know that they're important and that they change your life. And that you, here's what I really here's what I admire about you. Here's what I respect about you. And you nourish that friendship and tend it. And then you have another friendship that you just basically take for granted right. and like, you know, oh, well, you know, okay, whatever, you know, you can mm -hmm. be my friend or not be my friend. And you never give that person your active appreciation. You're going to have two really different relationships. Right. Two, and so I, I just say all the time, it's not that appreciation, and I always like to take the opportunity to kind of differentiate it from law of attraction, which is manifestation. Like when people say you can, you can manifest what you want, whatever you want. If you think it, you're going to get it, you know? And it's like, mm -hmm. if you want, if you want more money, you're going to get it if you believe it and you have your affirmations every day. But the thing about grateful living is it's not about getting more. The reason why you're right. grateful and the reason why you appreciate what you have is not like, okay, because then it's going to quadruple in my bank account. No, <laughs> you you do it so that you actually feel that sense of like, wow, I have enough. Maybe I actually have enough. Maybe I'm like, okay, the way that it is. And I can really live now instead of waiting for something else to come fully alive. Right? Yeah. 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 There's, there, there's something strange about like the, the way that the law of attraction usually comes off is like it it sounds spiritual mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and like like the way that it's delivered is spiritual but it kind of goes against most of the spiritual messaging which is like push 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 pursue 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 but like most of the spiritual mes messaging in your book as well is the other way around it is and i think actually there's a lot of people who really get in touch with that i also think that the belief you know, there was a book written called The Secret, which was written by yep. this woman, Rhonda Byrne or whatever. And just the, the idea that the I, it's so consumer based. It's so kind right. of like, you know, um, as if everybody is meant to all have the same thing and we're all meant to be at the top echelon. And if you want it, you can have it. It doesn't take into account like all of the institutional challenges and the truths about life that keep like some that people too, you can yeah. want something as right. much as you you could like as much as the person next to you but if you have all kinds of challenges and disadvantages in your life and you you know that i think it's important to acknowledge all of those other things that come along with it and this way of thinking in my mind denies all of that it denies context and it denies yeah um so many things and so i don't consider it very spiritual i think it's actually the opposite i think reverence for mystery and reverence for the fact that we're not in control of everything like learning to really live into that yeah. is much more spiritual than okay right. i've got i've got this and i'm on my track and i'm going to get this and this and this that's what I'm going to say the next time so somebody asks me what my plan is for the podcast i'm i'm just going to rattle that off 
when yeah, I yeah, yeah. Reverence for mystery. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna go. I uh, just have a reference for mystery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but guess what? I think that's when really cool things happen to us too. It's true. Yeah. You know, I mean, the truth is, you can plan like nobody's business and have everything all laid out like as if it's all going to happen the way and the, and it just never does but people stay attached to the idea that like that plans are so concrete and so solid and so assured and yeah. and sometimes the greatest things in life happen when we don't count on them right so it's like yeah. the wonderful surprises in the world and so yeah, I think I think it's great not to have a plan. You you tell him I said so. Reverence for <laughs> one of my guests told me that reverence for mystery is a way to move forward. Christy Nelson said. Christy yeah, Nelson said. one of, one of my guests. <laughs> um, you, you you write about that in the book, and you, you talk about embracing that when you were going through a period where no, nobody knew what was going on, and you guys were struggling to find a diagnosis. Totally. From that point forward. Did did you see a change in your life in terms of like planning and like structuring? Do you find that now you're more spontaneous or had, had you always kind of been that way? Really good question. Again, you just the best question to ask her. You should have a Thanks. podcast. Thanks. Um, just kidding. Um, <laughs> so I would say that, you know, I don't know if you know Myers-Briggs, you yep. know, the whole, right. So I'm an ENFJ. And J's love closure and they love things to be figured out and bows tied around everything and decisions are made and plans are laid out and, and time, time is something that you can control and plan. And, you know, right. we tend to be the people who like to schedule things and you know, all those. Stuff. So I've always been that way. I'm much less so in my older life, as I get older and if I, as I recognize the beauty of spontaneity, the beauty of staying open to surprise, like mm -hmm. being open to, to things that I wasn't expecting. Um, I've learned to really relish that I think a lot more. And, and I did learn the boy, the trap, especially in a medical situation. Like I was so attached to figuring and my family and friends, like we were just desperate to know what was happening to my body and mm -hmm. why it was so sick. And, and I kept thinking, you know, okay, as soon as we know, then something is going to happen and then I'm going to get better. And then I realized after so many months, it took nine months, nine months of not knowing and being in the hospital and getting sicker. And, and, and at some point I had to let go because I wanted to live. It was like, okay, what if I don't, what if this is really about facing my mortality and I'm hanging everything on, I've got to know, I've got to know, I've got to have a name for this. I've got to be able to have a treatment plan, but what if that doesn't happen? Am I going to kind of die in this incomplete way and say that not knowing had more power over me than my wanting to be alive and really treasure the the possibilities in my life, even not knowing, not knowing what was going to happen to me. And that was a big shift because I think I had always been attached to that knowing before. And then I got liberated from that a bit during that process because it was humbling, you know, nothing, nothing more to know. So did that experience help you shift your perspective with time where it seems like as you get older and you have a better gauge of time, it's it's easier to recognize the value in in smaller moments but when you're younger like like mm -hmm. you, you were young when this happened and yeah. you know people my age and um with my life up until this point it's like you you think there there's so much time left that you kind of just like overlook the mundane and like one of the principles is the, um thinking about the extraordinary in the ordinary yeah did yeah. Did, did that experience for you kind of like help snap into place like your perspective on time to start looking at what's right in front of you more and paying more attention to it? 100%. That was the biggest, I would say the biggest change of my whole life mm. is that. And um, I've lived the past 30 years. So it's been 30 years since I finished treatment, um, which is just radical because it's almost as long as I was alive before, you know, pretty soon. If I, if I get to live another year or two, I'm going to reach that point where I've been along as long, alive as long after as I was before. So 30 years. 
And the biggest thing that I got out of cancer, I would say, is not taking life for granted, not taking time for granted, because there's all the ways in which we take things for granted that we have and privileges and um, technology and all the, all the things that are amazing that we have that some people don't have. And people, we take people for granted and we take our car for granted and we take public transportation for granted, all those things. The thing that I think is the biggest game changer is what if you stop taking time for granted? Yeah. And so you're a hundred percent right in asking that question, which is it changes everything. It changes everything. What if you stop taking life for granted that you've got more life? Because we so often say like, oh, when this, this, and this happened, then I'm going to really be fulfilled. I'll really be alive. I'll really be a grown up. I'll really be happy. I'll be grateful. Maybe not. Yeah. You're going to yeah, give I've, up the whole journey. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've, I mean, I've swung and missed on that one like every time. Like at, <laughs> at, at, at any time that I've like picked some kind of, and it's, I, I think it, I think it might have something to do with with personality. Like you mentioned, My, Myers Briggs, and I'm I'm a little bit more familiar with the Big Five, um, but I I I wonder how much personality. What's the has, Big Five? Tell me. The Big Five traits is the ocean traits. You have openness, oh. conscientiousness, um, extroversion, agreeableness, neuroticism. Okay, and what do uh, you have? What are you? Um, generally speaking, I'm I'm higher in openness, higher in conscientiousness. Um, moderate and extroversion, lower in agreeableness and lower in neuroticism. Um, Ooh. but, and well, and the, the, the thing about the trace is like, it's, it's not supposed to like be good or bad wherever yeah. you sit. It's more just about like knowing yeah. where you sit. But, um, I, it's, it's strange. Like I know some people that are very goal oriented and that works really well for them, but yeah. th that doesn't seem to work that well for me. And I, I wonder if that has something to do with it, but, um, like, 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 like you were saying with saying, you know, once I achieve like X, Y, or Z, I, I've seen that work for people, but for whatever reason, that just doesn't really work for me. Like it, it, it seems to be kind of like a fool's errand in terms of, I guess, my own personality. Good to know. So important yeah. to know. I think we're a very, in terms of the culture, I think we're very goal oriented, yeah. right? So we're, this is how we're trained. We're trained mm -hmm. to be, to, to pin things on the future and always, you know, the hard part is, how long do people allow themselves to really relish achieving a goal, right? So it's like mm -hmm. until the next goal and then the next thing. And my my concern is just when do we get to really celebrate? When is enough? Yeah. When do we know what enough is? And so I think we are really wired differently and people who are not wired as much toward ambition. I mean, I will call it ambition. Um, I think we can tend to feel like we're, we're somehow outside, you know, and that, oh God, maybe I don't have enough ambition to make my dreams come true. And I think there's all kinds of other energies that serve us besides ambition. And ambition can absolutely negate the moment at hand because you are so busy striving, right? So striving means you're just kind of trying to move somewhere else other than where you are. And so I think it prevents us from appreciating a lot of where we are. Yeah. You, you mentioned this when you started thinking differently like this and taking on this perspective, it put you at odds a little bit with people in your peer group because mm -hmm. you were no longer interested in some of the things that they were no longer had some of the desires that, that they've had. Um, I, I've going through college, I've, I've dealt with a little bit of that from like, friends with like high school and stuff. And like, you just kind of like go different ways, like different people want different things. Um, how did you adjust to that and kind of deal with that with, if, if maybe there were people that, that you were close to that you just didn't connect with on that level anymore? You know, I still have some good friends from that time period. And I also have a lot of new people in my life. You know, I made a lot of interesting new relationships. I think one of the things that, you know, I would say that certain things kind of fell off the, my, fell out of my ideals of what it was that I wanted for my life. Like, so money started to seem like a really kind of empty 
aspiration, people who are really driven by money. And in, in their thirties, there's a lot of people who are like, I've got to have a certain amount for retirement and I'm going to, um, you know, kind of give up the moment in order for the, for the future. Um, and wanting more, 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 more. And it was hard to ever be satisfied with what people had. And, and I know that it's really a strong, a strong force in our culture. Um, and I would say that things like money became very demystified for me. It, yeah. uh, you know, when you get told that you might not make it three years and there was no amount of money that was going to make a difference to me to about that prognosis truly like you know and i think sometimes health is like the great it's a great equalizer you yeah. know there's there's these things that level the playing field for a lot of us and and death is one <laughs> death is one of them <laughs> right. um and you know um and i felt really i think i've always been really grateful that there were a lot of things that i stopped wanting in my life at that time. And I've never really gotten caught up in the trappings of wanting those things again. And I have a really beautiful life and I'm so lucky and I try to appreciate it every day, but boy, do I know that getting caught up in wanting more is really painful. There's creates a lot of suffering for people. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've, I grew up with a sports background. There's a lot of that. And then I started off college in business school, a lot of that. Um, so like, and I, I was, I've, I've been wrapped up in plenty of that myself. And it, like, for me, it's kind of just been everywhere. Didn't, did you have a moment when you, you kind of just realized like where, where you kind of just looked around and like, maybe you looked at on TV and like what, se what, what people seem to be valuing. And you just kind of thought that we just in general were, were lost and that, that you'd like <laughs> in a way, like, like in terms of like valuing those things in the way that, that we typically do. And that like, did, did you feel that, that you found something like much deeper that was kind of like right in front of us hiding in plain sight? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I, I stopped watching TV. <laughs> that was much of sure. I did. I mean, I actually, um, you know, there, there, our choices that we can make about how we give our attention in mm -hmm. our lives. That's like the biggest choice that we have, I think is where do you put your attention and to what do you, um, to, do you give this precious commodity? Like this amazingly important resource. It's a currency, you know, it's like, like money, and people are very you know, thoughtful about where they put their money sometimes, but it's like your attention, your time, your, your energy, these things, it's like how you create a life. And so I would say that there were times I'll have to say, this is very interesting to reflect on this. I remember having a nightmare, like a recurrent nightmare. Boy, I haven't talked about this in forever. So you, if you're in psychology, Jake, you're going far. That's like, yeah, you're like, you're pulling all these things out of me. So, um, I had this recurrent nightmare that was about, I was, I was going to survive, but that if I survived that the people I, I would have to be willing to leave the people I loved behind. And it was this really kind of awful, it was a really terrible image, kind of like, um, Armageddon like, you know, it was like not, not a pleasant dream. Yeah. And I remember thinking it was so hard at one point to realize that if I, if I went in a direction that was different than the people I was going, that I was going to find all kinds of amazing new people, that there were going to be so many people along that new pathway and people who are going to be not just meeting me and greeting me, but teaching me and inviting me into bigger places in my life. But it was going to mean risking what was familiar to me and what was comfortable to me sometimes. And I think to go the path that was to really honor myself, it didn't mean being lonely. Like there was some point in my life where I needed to really reconcile that. It was not about, I wasn't going to need to be alone. I was going to actually find, um, there were always going to be people who I was going to find 
who were going to be peers and teachers for me. And that's proven to be true, but it does take, I think there's times in life where we have to be willing to go a different direction than other people are going. And then you find so much new resource. Is that kind of speaking to what you were asking yeah. a little bit? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so taking that, that leap of faith that you'll be able to find like people and things that are, or pursuits that are more suited to you kind of helps you like to take that gap of like maybe loneliness for a little bit or that, that yeah. fear of like, let, let go of that fear of um, r releasing like the environment that you had, that you'd become familiar and comfortable with. hundred percent, a hundred percent. And I think there's also one of the things I think about is there's so many amazing stories now about people who actually, yeah. you know, I mean, you were in an MBA track or a business track or something like that. Right. So there's so many people who get um, disillusioned and you, there's so many places to read incredible, inspiring stories about people who say, I wanted something different. You know, my soul was discontent. I was like in this track that everybody from the outside would say looked like it was the right track for me. And it was, yeah. you know, successful and I was going to be affluent and blah, blah, blah. But I was miserable and I didn't feel known and I didn't feel like I was really who I was. And I wasn't, I wasn't learning. I wasn't enjoying life. I mean, I love those stories. There's been so many more of those in the past few decades because yeah. I think a lot of people just said, wait a minute, all it's all a, a big hype. Like there's so much hype about that. And there's a lot of people who aren't happy and look at then they go and they become organic farmers or they do whatever yeah. they do. Yeah. You know, it's like, right. Every, all these people are now organic farming in the Catskills and all over the place. So, but I think, you know, or doing whatever it is that brings them joy because yeah. that's also too saying life is precious. Why am I going to compromise? At some point you have to like look at yourself and say, oh my God, I'm having a stress breakdown. I'm having mm -hmm. illness that's really making me sick. I'm having misery and like difficulties in my relationships and I'm not happy. Oh my God, leap, you know, trust life enough to try something completely different. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's... As far as I know, there's definitely a lot more stories saying, like, I was pursuing this and then realized it was kind of fruitless, and then I changed my life and now I'm much happier. I don't really ever hear that going in reverse. That's so true. It's like, so it's so, oh. uh, I, I, I've had a lot of, like, growing up, I've, I've had a lot of pressure to pursue those kinds of paths. Yeah. Is that, both from myself and um, people around me, is that... Is is that something that that you struggled with? Did did you have like did did you have to have like difficult conversations where you're like mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not going down that road even though everybody wants me to do this yeah. or that? When I was much younger, so when I was um, I did something in 1978 that was really unpopular, which was I was um, graduating high school and I decided to not go to college yeah. uh, immediately. And that was so unpopular. I can't eat with my family. I mean, my grandfather just, I almost caused yeah. him an early death. I mean, my father who, for, who's a professor and just thinks education is the most important thing in the whole wide world. And, and I just knew myself enough to risk, you know, to risk disapproval to, to be able to say, I know that I'm not ready to learn more now in an institutional setting. I need to learn more out in the world and I need to travel and I need to try different kinds of things. And, and so when I did start college, so the belief was out in the world and among my elders and stuff is if you don't go right after high school, you're never going to go. And I thought that was the most ludicrous idea in the entire world. It's like, well, <laughs> then, right? like if you don't, it means if you give it one iota of consideration, then you're not going to do it. So it's like, you better just stay in that track because you're in these grooves, the tracks right. are set for you. And so if you get off there, you're never going to want to go back. Well, then you're not trusting the appeal of higher education. Right. So I said, I'm going to go back. And I did. It took three and a half years. I traveled. It was almost four years. And I, I so I became a, a freshman when I was 22, when most people were graduating. Uh, and I've never regretted that decision. But those kinds of decisions, those are, 
I'm very unpopular when I talk about it because most people, young people's parents who hear me talk about that are really like, <laughs> do not promote this, um, this thing. It, it, it's, it's such a weird, like, it's become so cult-like to just like fall into that. Like, like, don't, don't think about it. And like, this, yeah. this is the only way, like, this is what you have to do. Yeah. It's, it's so straight. I, I don't understand it. And uh, like, yeah. and you, you were talking about that back then back when I think it was more important than it is now. Like College. I, with, yeah, like with, um, all, like all the access to information that we have online and yeah. books and so everything true. right now, it's like, I mean, I, like personally, I think I, I think I learned more on my own. Like, so yeah. it's, so I, I, yeah, I mean, you, you being willing to like take that leap back then was like much more courageous. And like, I, I have various friends that have, dropped down there, there's a lot of like talk about that and like just going and doing stuff like if you if you have something else that that, that you want to do but what what allowed you to kind of like in the face of that uh that that pressure and just just be willing to do it anyway i don't know but i just you go know i don't think there's a formula for those kinds of things but right. i think that it was i'm willing to pay the price for my freedom, for my happiness, mm -hmm. to to live from my heart in some way that I I believe I can trust. Yeah. So those kinds of things are really important and and to cultivate that capacity, but it really is it really does fly in the face of what our culture is telling us is important. Even when in some ways like at, when I went to college and when I did graduate work and everything, it, it was less common than it is now. Like now, you know, back then, if you got a BA, you were assured a good job, a decent job. Then it was like a master's, you know, and then even like, then it was like, okay, now a master's isn't enough. So now you need like a specialized degree or a doctorate or something like that. And you've got to try. And so I think it just, the thresholds keep getting higher about what's necessary to achieve in order to really feel successful or be successful in the world and economically, um, you know, successful. So I, I do think it's worth, it's really worth scrutinizing and it's worth reading about people who have taken alternate paths and keep reading poetry, you know, keep yeah. the people. Who, um, so it's, you know, I think it's so meaningful to try to just say, what does it mean to live the life that I'm meant to live, that I'm meant to live. And nobody else is going to know that. Um, and to be humble about that, you know, to, to listen, to listen deeply to, to what, to what comes from wisdom internally, from what wisdom comes externally and be really tuned, live like a tuning fork, you know, like just really tuned in to what's around you and inside you. So that 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 relates to um, one of the things I was going to ask about that uh, you you've talked about with this with this book with this idea of gratefulness is mindfulness practice. Mm -hmm. Now you trained with John Kabat Zinn. Was I did. was that was that before or after you got sick? So crazy is I finished chemotherapy. September uh, 1993, 20, September 1993. And John Kabat-Zinn was leading his first professional five-day training at the Omega Institute that September, at the end of September. And I had done some mindfulness meditation. I'd done some Vipassana Buddhist meditation beforehand and stuff. And I thought to myself, I really want to go do this thing. And it fell in the literally the two week period between when I finished chemotherapy and I had to start radiation treatment every single day. So it was right in the midst of this journey, being given this crazy prognosis and not knowing what was going to happen. And it was one of the most rich and beautiful things I've ever done. And, and I, I love that man, John Kabat-Zinn, and I still connected to him and he's just an amazing human being. And, um, but that was right in the midst of it. It was not before and, and it was not really after I kept working. I worked in his clinic after that. I was an intern in his clinic for a period of time and, and really got to see the power 
of um, mindfulness, mindfulness based stress reduction, MBSR is what they called it that at the time, but mindfulness meditation for people going through chronic pain and yeah, yeah. So it's a very powerful intervention in people's lives and a beautiful one. And it helped me a lot. And I also then got to help other people practice that. Do, do you practice that on a daily basis? Does that, is that something that, that you use as an anchor? You know, what I would say is that I, I, I meditate, but I meditate very just, uh, you know, I'll read my poetry, I'll do a short meditation and then I write. Mm -hmm. And so that's my morning ritual. I'm not a 45 minutes sitting on a cushion anymore person. Um, and partly because, you know, I'm like, oh my God, it's beautiful outside. I want to be out. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like I treasure, like, and I struggled a lot having my eyes closed a lot. I've done silent retreats. I've done like the longest silent retreat I did was nine days at a, at a, yeah, it's a long time. And silence <laughs> is really, really deep and wild. And if you want to face yourself, just go into a silent retreat for nine days. It's like, there's no escaping. Um, But, but I, I love life and I love to be engaged and in the fold of life and really um, in the world in a way and in myself and, and having that, that, that relationship between myself and the world and life. And so uh, what I believe is that gratefulness absolutely requires mindfulness. You cannot live a, a grateful life without being mindful because being mindful is about being fully present and fully attuned and aware to where you are. And that's the precondition for gratefulness. Yeah. Right. So that comes first. And, and so for me, one of the things that I, I really feel is that gratefulness incorporates mindfulness for me. And so when I'm, and I think one of the things that I love to challenge people around is you know, you can do anything and sit on the cushion and you can do yoga on your yoga mat and have this great spiritual, all your good thoughts and everything. How are you in the rest of your life? How do you treat the people who wait on you at a restaurant? How do you deal with people in traffic jams? How, you know, like, how are you in life? And so for me, that's where the rubber hits the road. And I consider mindfulness practice to really come alive and gratefulness practice to really come alive is how do you show up? to life and to the things that are difficult and you didn't expect and things that don't go your way. Um, that's really where it matters most. And so, yeah, you've got to cultivate the practice. And so whatever it takes to, to learn like, Oh, like my stepson, he learned mindfulness when he was young, probably young college, maybe, um, maybe, maybe late high school, but, um, he, for him, it made a huge difference. It was like he could catch himself. Oh, I I lost myself there. And so learning that is really key. And so whatever it takes to learn to live more mindfully is great. And then keep going, you know, keep going. And I'd say, keep piling gratefulness on there. Keep piling love on there. You know, what does it look like to really live your heart out loud? What does it look like to really treasure life? And nobody would not know it, that you yeah. think that life is just the biggest, most amazing trip and gift in the whole world. And like how the, you know, what, you know, that we get to be alive today. Um, and, and I always say that that takes vulnerability. It takes the willingness to kind of people go like, whoa, you are weird, you know, and I'm like, <laughs> not really anymore. Um, but I think there are risks we need to take to be like, Life is too precious to just treat it like it's this rote thing. And, and so, and the more I live my heart out loud, the more people are drawn and are curious and, and want to connect with that themselves, the more I'm aware of that. And I think we need each other. We need each other to live that way, to live our hearts out loud and to live our own purpose and to explore what that means and take risks and stuff. And because we, we take inspiration from one another so deeply. So why not be that source? Yeah. For... You are that source. 
You are that source, Jake Warner. I know. I'll do it. my best. I'll try. You are. You already are. <laughs> you don't have to do anything. You're already doing it. Right. For for people who want to get in touch with you and your work, where, where can mm. they find you? Oh, great. Thank you. Um, well, I was leading this organization for 10 years. Now I'm not there anymore. And um, I my website is christinelson.net, K-R-I-S-T-I-N-E-L-S-O-N. And the book came out in paperback in November. It's I like the paperback a lot. And I was able to make a few changes to that. So that's nice. So Wake Up Grateful, you can find me there. Um, you know, wherever good books are sold, I don't know. You can find me all over the place, but you can people, my website is, my website's fun and there's good podcasts on there and maybe I'll put this one up there. That'd be fun. Thanks. And there's podcasts and there's articles and all that stuff. And, and I'm just honored if anybody's interested in knowing more. And I'm very honored by your interest in having a conversation with me today. Well, cool. thanks a lot for coming on and uh, for turning your experiences into a book like that. Uh, I've, I, I really think it'll be helpful for me to have hooks to, to remember. So I don't like keep forgetting these things and um, yeah. for, for anybody else who wants to check it out, I would highly recommend it. So thank you a lot for your time today. Thank I really you. appreciate you coming on. You betcha. Keep going. Thanks. I will. <laughs>